Welcome everyone. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Welcome to Facebook Live. It is, uh, I think it's the 9th of March. I cannot see the date. It's the 9th of March, year 2022. And we are here. The, some of the members of the panel are here and some of the fellow group members are here. So let me get started on quick introductions. I am going to start off with the brightly colored Eileen, who is a mindfulness teacher and holds her own meditations both in VR and on Zoom and sometimes leads our group meditations and does an inc incredible job of keeping us uh, streamlined. Good evening, Eileen. Thank you for being here. And then uh, we have April, who has been on our panel for a while. Um, she's a psychic. Uh, she has quite a few modalities of uh, healing, and one of them being psychic and a spiritual teacher. Good evening, April. Thank you so much for joining us back. I know she was traveling uh, to the beautiful California, Ojai, California. And I also see Kelly and Kelly, who are our Qigong teachers. Good evening, Kelly and Kelly. Thank you for joining. And then we also have Patricia, who's joined us, a fellow member. Thank you, uh, Patricia. And also Michelle is here. Good evening. So last week, um, I, I think Michelle and Patricia may remember um, we were discussing, there was a mother who had a addiction issue, right? And her son had an addiction issue. And then she was saying that, and they were on the path to recovery. They had done counseling. They were, they had, they were on the path to recovery. And she was wanting her daughter to reconcile and not hold resentment for her. So we were talking about that. And out of that, Sandhya asked this question. Let me post it. And you all have to think of when was this relevant? She says, I noticed that some assume everyone around them is miserable and try fixing them with their suggestions and, and advice. What do you say about them? So Sandhya wants to know, I noticed that some assume everyone around them is miserable and try fixing them with their suggestions and advice. What do you say about them? Okay, April, since you're back, you wanna hit it out of the park? <laughs> yeah. So is she wanting to know how to respond to them or she just wants to know what our opinion of them is? Uh, I think, what do you say about them? I, I don't know. I cannot remember the conversation, why in between our conversation, something would have arisen. But I think the question more is uh, everyone around them is miserable and they try fixing them with their suggestions and advice. Why is yeah. that? Thank you. Well, um... I would say it depends on the context. Um, you know, if she is per se on a group and the group is in that arena, then of course that's the purpose of the group. The, the members are looking to help and support and heal each other. So um, when she says everyone around them, that's why I'm wondering like what the context is. Um, <clears throat> I think, uh, I'll give you the context because the mother wanted her daughter um, mm -hmm. the way we were discussing was the mother okay the mother and the son were healing on the path to healing and she wanted her daughter to heal as well because the daughter was holding uh, resentment and uh, depression I think pain mm -hmm. against the mother because what the mother would have put her through during her addiction right Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the mother is trying to fix the daughter. So that I think that's the context. 
So this is the daughter asking, why does everyone think we're miserable? Uh, this is Sandhya asking out of that conversation, Sandhya asking that she notices that some assume everyone around them is miserable. Like the mother is assuming that her daughter is miserable. Mm, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah. Again, it, and I, uh, I mean this with the deepest um, niceness. I don't know how to say that. People, humans, we are notoriously self-centered. We are notoriously self-centered. Whatever we are thinking, whatever we are feeling, whatever we are going through, we tend to project that onto others. So if I feel like the world is after me, all the events in my life that probably have nothing to do with me, I will feel like are about me. And this includes when I'm on a healing journey or when I'm trying to heal, now I'm seeing life, people, events through that lens, through that perception. So I will then assume that everybody else is just as miserable as I was or I am and that they need fixing because that's what I needed. And we all have to get fixed now so we can be healthy. So this is, you know, what I'm getting from this. And this is what I find happens. Um, what we are dealing with, what we are going through, our level of consciousness, all of that plays a part in how we actually see the world, approach the world, deal with the world. Um, and this is why you can have a scenario and everybody else um, <clears throat> tells you a different story, right? Same event, different story. The other thing is that I don't know where the mom is on the healing, but perhaps the mom, if she is on a healing journey, she has raised her consciousness level. And while the daughter, so we're just gonna use this as the scenario, the daughter isn't conscious yet or aware that she is actually suffering, that the ego is at play, that there are walls, that mom can see it because she's at a higher consciousness. Her perception has changed. So, and the daughter's like, hey, I'm fine. Just leave me alone. I don't need to deal with any of like, and I'm just, again, using that as an example. Um, so for me, it would probably be either one of those. The other option is that some, many of us like to fix other people. And we like to be in other people's business. It gives us something to do. I always said I did not need to watch a soap opera. I have days of our lives right here, right now. I have got teenage girls. <laughs> so I don't need to watch it, right? Um, and for a long time, because of the pattern that my mom had, and actually even a little bit on my dad's side, uh, from my grandmother uh, passed when I was young, even though I was close to her, but the stories I heard afterwards was that she was in other people's business, right? So that could be another aspect of this. So I would, um, if somebody else is doing that to you and you are not actually wounded um, and you are actually whole and well, then just see it as that's what they feel. That's their perception. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to take it personal. You don't have to get upset. You're just where, oh yes, she thinks everybody needs to be fixed. And you just accept that. You, you, that's fine. So that's how I would, that's how I would, I don't know what I would say to them. I would probably say, uh-huh. Okay. Thank you. Right. My dad used to say that my grandfather, before he was injured, uh, would drive through a parking lot and somebody would flip him off. And he and they said, which I was kind of surprised for knowing my grandpa's personality um, from what they told me, he would wave at him and they'd flip, be flipping him off and he'd wave. Thank you. Have a good day. Right. Just thank you. You don't let it bother you. Just keep on going. Beautiful. Mm. I I think uh, Byron Katie says um, something of the nature, um, like she says, if somebody says you're a liar, right, then we have to look in 
I mean, like they're saying, uh, they try to fix us by saying, oh, I think you lied. So let me give you suggestions on how not to lie. I'm just giving an example, right? And Byron Katie says, you can always go back in your past and look where you lied. You may not be a liar in this moment, right? But there may be a point in time. So you can always find that quality. We can always find that quality in us. So that's something to be examined when somebody says something. I would give that kind of attention to that. I would look into myself and see what is that person trying to point for me? If it's not there, then it's not there, but I would still examine, right? Yeah, and in that context, which that, that is something that I do as well is, you know, perhaps the universe is asking you to examine something because it was brought up, so yeah. Right, perfect, thank you. Michelle, did you wanna say something about this? Yeah, as you all were speaking and I was like, I, mean, I had to read that quite a few times to let it sink, but I'm getting that maybe that person that's assuming everyone around them is miserable. It's miser It's like mirroring her misery, you know, and she maybe has this feeling that she has to fix them in order for herself to feel good. So it's like a reflection of where she's at, you know, a bit of control. I don't know if she's intending to control, but when you're, when she's saying offering suggestions and advice, so this is the plan. This is what you need to do. Step one, step two, step three, right? And then, you know, there's control there, right? That you wanna like being here, Today, I spent the day like listening to my mom and my sister and, you know, with my mom being elderly and all this pain that she has in her knee and offering surrender, right? I'm not telling her what to do. I'm, I am like practicing so much presence so that I could just be there and, and loving awareness, right? And just holding that space. But, you know, she knows what she has to do. And if she doesn't do it, she doesn't do it. And I got to let that go, right? She's 83, she's grown woman. And she's got a right to like, today, I don't feel good. And I'm not going to do my exercises. And I'm like, so, so I think that there's a lot of surrender that needs to happen there. You know, you got to let people, you know, you can have the conversation once, maybe twice. But at the end of the day, they find their own way. Whether it's it, what you say or the complete opposite or somewhere in between, you know? A lot of that, you know, we gotta let go of the expectations, the control, and then find our own happiness. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that insight. Yeah, I guess, um, like if you're feeling that sense of lack and incompleteness within, then we are going to try and fix everyone external to us. That's what you're saying, right? Yeah, like I so that, let my world be perfect around me. Let all the people be perfect around me so that my world is per perfect. Kind of like what's happening in Ukraine, right? I mean, there's so much there, right? It's so much suffering. And, and we feel like if we don't feel that suffering, then we're not empathetic. But we can't do anything by sitting in that suffering. We're not making it any better for them, right? So... I think we have to sit back, like the, you know, see it, understand that it's not a good situation, but try to come through like loving presence. I mean, that that's what's been with me lately is coming through more of a loving awareness perspective. Um, and making and 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 just nurturing that, nurturing that growth, you know. Um so yeah, I think that, you know, it, if we need everybody around us to be happy, for me to be happy, or for you yourself to be happy, then you're never gonna be happy because it's just not the way it works. Beautiful. Thank you, Michelle. Whoop, sorry, went to mute. <clears throat>
Thank you. Eileen, did you want to say something about this? Um, I was just going to say when I first read it that um, the person's asking the question is saying, what do I, what do we say about them? I'm guessing they're talking about, you know, the people that are constantly trying to fix others or assume that others are miserable. I feel like um, a lot of the things that other people have said since I first had my thought, but then um, it's obviously not being present <laughs> because if we're being present um, in each moment, I don't think there would be any thinking of people being miserable um, and the fixing would kind of just happen as being present and not like trying to fix or advise someone. I'm not sure if I'm making sense, but um, I just feel like for me, I don't just go out and start telling people what to do or what not to do. Um, if someone comes to me and asks for advice or suggestion, then that's obviously what's meant to be in that present moment. And then we, we talk, but to me, it just means the person's not actually being fully present. Beautiful. Thank you, Eileen. Mm -hmm. Kelly and Kelly, does that make sense? The question? Yep. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Yep. Thank you. Um, I think if, if whether or not other people are miserable, isn't really any of our business, <laughs> right? Like, because it's, it's, uh, you can't do anything about where someone else is at. And I know when I first started going on this journey, I was really excited about the things I was learning, the things I was reading, and you want to tell people about it. And then sometimes it comes across that, oh, you start, when you start seeing patterns in yourself, for example, you, you can see them in other people. And I think it's always easier to see where other people have behavior patterns that they're repeating. But then you got to turn that finger around or the mirror and go, well, if I can see that in someone else, it's probably because I've got that issue in me. So I need to look at that and where I have that. And so sometimes we want to quote unquote, like fix people because our ego is like, well, if I'm learning this and they learn it too, then we, we can all keep our group together because our egos don't like it. If people grow, we don't like it when people grow apart or if we're not, you know, especially family units or friends, you know, things like that. So I think sometimes when we want to, we want to sort of fix someone or, you know, inform them because if they know the same thing and they understand it, then, oh, we all get to be happy together. <laughs> and that's not really the way it works. And with the, the, the example of the mom who wanted her daughter to heal as well, I guess my question would be whether or not that person feels guilty. Because sometimes when we are healing stuff, because there's things like I have four kids. So there's always things like when I heal things that I have to wait for it to come up in my kids. I can't force them to heal something that they're not ready to look at. So that's a big thing to do is to step back because sometimes we feel guilty about something. So we want to try to rush someone else's healing so that we feel better. When really what we have to do is deal with whatever our feelings are and how we feel about it. And whenever it comes up for them or when they want to look at it, then we can hold the space for them to be able to talk to us about it. Yeah. Yeah, the, um, the question is an interesting one. Yeah. It is one that also points to needing to be aware of uh, projection outward at other people. Uh, April, you know, said it really well that yeah, it's like people like to uh, be in other people's business. Yeah. And that's ego attachment. And that's uh, all about uh, shadow control and emotional fixes by being right, by being the righteous one, by not 
actually seen what we've done to ourselves because we're so fixated on fixing other people and projecting our self-righteousness outward onto other people to make ourselves feel better because of what we've done in the past. And yeah, the example with the, the, the mother wanting to fix or, or, or help her daughter heal is, um, again, yeah, you know, to put it bluntly, it's just like, just don't. Because everyone's on their healing journey. You cannot force anyone to heal ever, 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 ever. When you do, that is real karma. That is when you acquire real karma and real karmic debt by controlling somebody else or controlling an external situation. And also, just because you're ready to make amends yeah. to someone doesn't mean that they're ready to do that with you. It doesn't mean that you can't make the effort, but you cannot have the expectation that yeah. they're going to accept it in that moment. Or that they're going to be on the same page ever, yeah. ever. You know, um, the 12 step programs that are out there are all about expressing um, regret and remorse and probably what this mom should do is express regret, express remorse, but also express gratitude for the opportunity to still be communicating with their daughter and to express the gratitude for their own journey and the fact that their daughter is a part of this journey, regardless of what space that daughter is in. And this is sort of one of the things that I've also learned from my own personal experience is like, I stopped trying to convert <laughs> other people to, to my way of thinking a long time ago because, I mean, especially the last couple of years, uh, having uh, Kelly and her kids in, in such close proximity and constantly processing and helping them process and supporting uh, the entire collective unit process of growing mm -hmm. and realizing how different I am that no one can ever be on the same page as me. And letting go of the assumption that spiritual evolution is the same for everybody on a much deeper level. Uh, realizing that letting go of whenever, whenever we feel an attachment, whenever we feel we need to share something, we, you know, you want to let go of it first. And look at it and observe and see whether or not you've been filtering it through a limited belief system of what is right and what is wrong because that's also an ego attachment and an ego projection where we get really stuck on being right and needing to be right to feel good about ourselves because of what the bad stuff we've done in the past and this is sometimes a really hard concept for people to wrap their heads around because we're so stuck on helping others crucifying ourselves for others sacrificing ourselves for you know the greater good or even in service to others it's really important to understand how important our own spiritual journey is and how much it should take precedence in the most positive and loving kind generous mindful way how much it should take precedence over everything else around us and i say this in a way that is um, where I'm talking about letting go of ego attachment first. Don't act on the need first. Don't act on the need to be right or to fix somebody else. Because again, it's, it, it all comes back to whether or not we're actually being emotionally responsible and emotionally present and loving ourselves enough to actually let go of the need to even share with other people. Well, and sometimes in cases too, where you want to make amends, I think it's important to ask yourself, is this something that needs to be addressed immediately? Yeah. Yep. Because oftentimes someone else isn't ready and we try to force that and we try to make it happen. But if you're patient, the universe will always give you an opportunity yep. no matter who the person is. If, yes. And you have to be yes. listening for that yep. opportunity to go, yep. oh, this is the moment. This is when they're open. Yep. This is when we can we can do that. that. That's actually an awesome, awesome point to bring up thank you so much because one of the biggest things that i've learned in this whole process is those moments when you actually step back in observation when you actually step back into being present with yourself and emotionally responsible with yourself and spiritually present with yourself and your connection with self 
and you let that moment of need of emotional uh, fixation uh, pass by and you let go of it, it does create that space. And that moment of communication and yeah. conscious participation does actually happen a lot faster. The sooner you can let go of something, the sooner those spaces of actual communication in a neutral energy without any push or pull or judgment or fear or anger, the faster they actually happen. Awesome. Two cents? Penny jar? Yeah. Thank you, Kelly and Kelly. I like the initial um, introduction that you gave, Kelly, that when we are initially starting on our journey, we want everyone, like we know what the fix is and we want everyone to, hey, I know what your answer is and we are going to try and get them on the same page kind, kind of, right? Yeah, we want everyone we love to jump on the same train. Yeah. But not everyone's ready to get on the train with you at the same time. Yeah. And it's also, it's also a process of letting go of the false concept of love. Because we believe, like initially, I know for myself, like I got the T-shirt, I got a box full of T-shirts, eight ninety nine in the closet. If anyone wants one, still, still, <laughs> um, let them go. Let them go. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you got it. You got to let it go. Mm. It's like you know, the the concept of love becomes much deeper and much grander in terms of actually supporting someone without a need to teach them, without a need to show them the way, because your journey your path is yours and yours alone and no one else can walk it for you and you cannot help anyone else walk their own path you can support them and the way that you support them is through loving kindness of being present when those moments arise so that you're actually there so that they know that you're not going to push your perception of reality onto them you're just going to listen and you're just going to support them no matter what Eight ninety nine. Eight ninety nine. Going once, going twice, going twice. Thank you, Patricia. Did you want to say something about this topic or anything that uh, people have the insights provided? Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so everybody, that was excellent. Yes. Again, everybody does put that one little piece. For me, what came up first is actually. Uh, words from Anthony DeMello from the book that he said, well, we are all idiots, he said. You're an idiot, I'm an idiot, so <laughs> why, you know, even, you? nobody can fix anybody. And the other thing is that Eckhart Tolle said that everybody acts based on their level of consciousness. So observing that, okay, what, what do you say about people that try to fix others? It's also a judgment, right? A judgment on them. Like once you know that they're just acting based on their level of consciousness, it doesn't even bother you. You don't have to judge them or, and um, like April said, it's natural, almost like our part of our human experience is we wanna fix others because we don't want to concentrate on ourselves, right? It's easier. It's just easier to point finger outwards. But then if you see that, that someone is doing it, again, you judging them, what does it tell about you? <laughs> now you throwing your judgment. Oh, look at them. I noticed that they're trying to fix them. Do they have right to do it? They're like, a, it's, it's just, again, another person judging someone else so what i would say practice presence just your own presence if you notice that you notice that pattern and someone else just saying okay i i guess i need to practice more more my presence more because once you are in that present moment it's gonna be a different quality i think of noticing that it also it's not gonna be a judgment it's just gonna be okay that's just part of their ego. And they that's the lesson they're learning. But also 
on top of the conversation we have last last week just like kelly and kelly said just accept it surrender support and that's what we can do fixing doesn't work that that's it's just not the word is just so attached to ego it's like ego needs to fix things it's very mind so we're working here on transcending the person into presence so just always always go back to yourself that would be my my suggestion that's what we can do because yes we are all idiots <laughs> in a sense trying to figure things out but that doesn't work <laughs> thank you Beautiful. thank you patricia ken did you want to say something about this topic i think you're on me Unmute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I just love what everyone had said and what uh, Kelly had, had said and what April had said really uh, inspired me on, on some really important notes um, that to me, the mother was in fear and she wanted to control and it actually reminded me of what I did most of my life and what annoyed me from other people, what they did to me. So this is just really helping me to confirm that if I'm not in presence, and which is what I'm learning to be now in my life, to me, presence is like a truth serum. And as I listen to others, I'm able to understand at a much deeper depth of what I'm listening to. And if I'm unconscious and I'm trying to control or trying to get my point across, I've noticed I've got a tone in my voice. I've got an attitude in my voice. And I'm, I'm gonna say that for me, that's a lot of mixed up fears trying to get its point across. And now learning just to listen and just be there for others and not say anything. There's more eye contact, there's more attention and realizing that people have to hear themselves. Because once I open up my mouth and say something, depending on where the other person's at, there's just going to be some competition. There's going to be things going back and forth. That's going to be mirroring. And then when I can just really be quiet and allow the person to hear for themselves without that inner turbulence coming from something outside yourself, you're able to hear the truth or you'll, you'll, you'll allow yourself to have what you need to hear on your own without somebody else trying to put that onto somebody. So it's, it's magnificent on how it was expressed and, and, and just how more and more confirmation of, of myself seeing the truth by listening to others that are in presence. So thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ken. Thank you. Who said, I don't know if it was on this Q&A or uh, I've been listening to different talks. Uh, somebody said that the answer is always within. Right? We already know the answer. The answer is always within. Yes. Uh, there's a question in the chat. 
Was a question from the daughter about the mother? If so, is the question about addiction? For example, how do you stop someone you love from using addictive? Is that what fixing them means in the question? Um, actually, I think it is. It was not so much as addiction, but it was more of the mother went through an addiction pattern, and the brother went through an addiction pattern, and the daughter was experiencing her brothers and mothers, like the pain of their addictive patterns, right? And somebody like maybe Ken has to explain what the addiction does to other family members that are not going through the addiction, right? Probably a lot of pain and suffering that uh, unconscious patterns in the mother and the brother would have affected the daughter slash sister. And that's who they're trying to want to make amends, but are not able to make amends because she's unconscious. She's in her pain. I hope that explains it. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. I was just going to say the fear that's in a parent when the child is addictive is that parent is out of control in fear. And so their turbulence, they don't realize it, how it has affected the person in the addiction and trying to control, getting upset, not realizing that both people are just frantic. And then, you know, um, Kelly had said something about loving. And for a lot of people, we think that we're loving one another. And in many ways, we're not loving. It's just a, a, a different communication going on with fear that is just um, perpetuating the turbulence of disconnection and disassociation. So... And uh, the caretaking can be just as severe as someone drinking. The best thing that someone can do is to really kind of take care of himself. And what everybody's been saying about being present, being calm, that way the person that's having the addiction will actually start to see in themselves. And sometimes the best thing you can do is remove both people from being around each other. And that way they can both feel energetically. They don't feel that disturbance. And then would be when people that understand that they're actually being, being helped so they can understand just what's going on with a, a, a being, being, being much clearer. So. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. This is a sensitive topic, April. So it's coming to you. Um, somebody posted in another Facebook group, so that's where I grabbed it. It says, how do you interpret ET in reference to self-preservation? Some single people in the Ukraine who are fleeing are leaving relatives behind who can't or don't want to travel, their elders, for instance. Would an enlightened individual justify leaving without them in order to survive knowing that their loved ones who encourage them to won't. And uh, we are in the year 2022. Uh, this, just to give a reference to if somebody watches this in the future, there is a war going on between uh, Russia trying to conquer Ukraine. And that's what we are discussing. You wanna say something about this, uh, April? Thank you. Knowing that their loved ones who encourage them to won't. Like maybe leaving your grandparents and parents behind. You're young, maybe you're in your 30s or something. And your grandparents are saying just go. Probably, uh, or the single person is saying, uh, I'm young, I'm just going to go across the border. I think people are fleeing to Poland, right? Uh, is that correct? A lot of uh, people from the Ukraine are, is that they're, they have a border together? Yeah, they're fleeing to po Poland. 
and seeking sanctuary there. Mm -hmm. um, the the statement has um, some judgments in it that <clears throat> uh, would an enlightened individual justify leaving? That's a judgment. Um, stating one that an enlightened individual would make a different choice than a per se normal or non enlightened <laughs> uh, being. So we're already putting some weight on enlightened individual. And in reality, an enlightened individual who makes a decision in presence would be following what? source creation god is leading them to do so it would be in a sense a justifiable act if you want to call it that but that justify that's also a judgment so a person in presence who makes a decision makes a decision that is not selfish it is in for the greater good of all it is what their inner guidance system is telling them to do and sometimes that is not in the best interest of others. Sometimes it's not. Um, so I don't want to. This is this is uh, a very sensitive subject. So I don't want to suggest in any way that somebody should or shouldn't leave because it would need to be an individual basis. Now, I do think many people are probably experiencing an extreme amount of fear and so perhaps even if they are enlightened because again enlightened people are humans um that they're fleeing and the grandparents or parents are saying i'm not leaving it's the same thing that happens if you have a hurricane or you have a volcano erupting people are living there and they're saying i'm not going i'm not leaving um and they also have that choice so I would remove the judgment of the enlightenment um, and understand that each person has their own reasons and their own um, justification for doing so. If it is an enlightened person, then the idea is that they would have made it in presence. Um, and then also we have to look at, uh, and I know again, that this is not the most popular answer but those people that are involved in this they did know in their timeline as a soul that this was going to happen they knew it and i know that as a human that sounds horrible and why would you and how could you and there's no way if it was me in that space i would say how is the how why would i sign up for this and even when i first heard of this happening my first instinct was are we two-year-olds? Are we two-year-olds fighting over whose truck is whose? Really? But instantly after I thought that, I thought, you know what? There's a reason. I don't know what the reason is, but I know there's a reason. Many times things like this happen on a grand scale because we need to wake up. We need to wake up. We need to become more conscious. We need to become more unconditionally loving. And I'm not saying I like it. I'm not saying I agree with it. I'm not saying any opinions. But what I do know is that when we have these kinds of traumas, we keep waking up more and more. We keep waking up and we keep realizing we are all one. And because of the internet and the global world and that, you know, before you would hear this, you would hear it two, three days later in the newspaper. Now you're hearing it instantly. It has a grander effect. There's a reason for that. There's a reason that, you know, my heart gets heavy for Ukraine and all of them. But at the same time, I hold that presence power, just like the last answer that we did. <clears throat> that I know that there's a grander reason. I know there's a purpose. I know that 
we are going to evolve out of this. We are going to become more conscious. We are going to become wiser, more loving. I know that. It's going to take a minute. <clears throat> so uh, off on my tangent here. I, as far as this goes, I don't feel like we should judge those that are leaving because one, they have a soul contract and two, um, they're leaving for their own reasons, whether that is fear or that is presence. They are leaving um, for their own reasons. And if they were meant to stay, they would stay. Right. Beautiful answer. Incredible, April. Like perfectly answered. Yeah, we never know that the people who are fleeing, they'll reach another country. They may be in Poland, maybe end up in the United States then do like enormous good for the whole world, right? That person can turn enlightened out of their experience because when they leave and go to another country, they have nothing, right? They probably have clothes on their uh, themselves and a backpack or whatever they have, and they have to start their life with nothing. What a journey that would be. And then now they have to evolve, right? So we never know what kind of good that they can do just because they went through this experience. To, so just like you said, um, April, we never know what that soul's journey is. That, yeah, it may seem on the surface that they are fleeing from their loved ones, but once they flee and reach another place, what good can come out of all of that? We can't fathom, right? They could be like saints out of their journey, right? Well, and that's how I see the whole uh, Hitler situation. If I wanted to move a mass amount of people consciously, then I would have that kind of event. I, again, not agreeing with it, but I would have that kind of event to wake up consciousness. That's what I would do. Um, and we don't know, uh, Adlerian therapy is one of, uh, is an awesome therapy that came from the Holocaust time. It was one of the survivors. So there is probably going to be numerous blessings out of this. Unfortunately, this has to happen. Um, but I just know from looking at all of the things and all of the events, uh, traumas and stuff that I've went through in my life I'm not saying I like it and I'm not saying it was fun to go through it but there are lessons in there you can learn from them it is growth and in this 3d plane where we still have duality because we still have not figured out how to all be one united with unconditional love we will have polarity and as long as we have to have that, you're going to have the light and the dark. And that is how we learn as of right now. Until we learn to go to the non-duality, till we learn how to live that way. The problem is, is that, and I do think that the scales are tipping. I do think more of us are waking up. So we are on, I think that's one of the reasons why I was so shocked that this was happening. Cause I was like, wait a minute, more of us are waking up. What, what the heck is going on here? Why, you know, I was kind of like, oh, really? But we always learn from our darkness. We always learn from our traumas. Well, not all of us, but most of us. Um, and if you don't learn it in this lifetime, you'll learn it in the next one. But uh, and, and like Eckhart says, if you haven't woke up, you haven't suffered enough yet, right? So unfortunately, it still caught, it still requires that in, in this uh, dimension, in this 3D plane. So yes, I, I don't know what the real reason is. Um, I haven't, I did my research on like what Ukraine was and who's involved and when it started actually, but I haven't done my meditation yet as to why. And I know that why is always 
going to be because we need to heal and we need to move forward as one. To move us to a more loving, compassionate planet. Thank you. I remember, like, uh, I haven't watched too much of Afghanistan, but when the uh, army was being pulled, I remember, like, uh, grandparents offering their grandchildren, like the child, it's a baby, offering it up to the uh, people that were leaving, right? So little babies were offered up. So I feel even the grandparents may want that for their grandkids or their children, right? That at least, okay, something may happen to me, but let my child survive. So they would be willing to, it's almost like, um, I think Ken was saying in one, uh, one of the uh, Facebook lives that people in Alaska, there's a tribe in Alaska, or Kelly may be saying that the elders uh, go away into the cold so that the younger, uh, younger people, like there's an understanding, perfect understanding. That's the nature of personal reality, right? Um, perfect harmony in the elders knowing that the young need to survive, right? So they go off into the cold and uh, like give up their lives for the young so that because there's not enough food in that area. So the young people are left with uh, enough means. So um, thank you, April. Uh, Michelle, did you want to say something? I know it's a heavy topic. Sorry about this. No, well, it's a, it's um, a little heavy for me because I come from two generations of um, leaving countries because you're being persecuted. So my grandparents had to leave Lithuania and Poland between World War One and Two, separating families, and they went to Cuba. And rifted apart, and my, and then then the family members in Cuba would bring over family members that were left in Poland and Lithuania. They would, you know, so if there's a blessing there that someone has to make that first step, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then my grandmother didn't know of her, the family that perished in the Holocaust till years later. I mean, there was no newspaper, nothing. It was just word of mouth. And she was very, I mean, she lived a life very, very resentful, very, you know, suffered the trauma of it all. And then they land in Cuba and then comes Castro. And my parents came here one week before the Bay of Pigs invasion with my brother and sister, you know what I mean? And so here you go, my parents left, left their parents in Cuba, right? The grandparents that had come from Poland, and then I was born here and then they had, and then my grandparents eventually came to the States and another brother of my, you know, another uncle of mine stayed in Cuba and everybody made their choices. And then my, my husband, the same thing, his parents, you know, didn't want to leave Cuba and he wanted to leave and, and just, you have to make your own choices. Beautiful. And here, right. And now the present, I, that's, I think that the past, lives in me and I think that's why I do this practice because there's so much trauma from past generations plus my own dharma that I you know have to work on but yeah I think you can you cannot put yourself in anybody's shoes and pass judgment on those decisions because everybody has a story and and or has their own reason and they have to listen to their own heart you know and there was a time when parents in Cuba were sending their children to the United States. They were called Peter Pan children and they, would, they were like orphans here. And they would go live in other families because their parents wanted their children to have a better life and sacrifice themselves and their love for their children so they could have, and that's an individual decision. Some people say, I have to keep the family unit together. There's no way I'm gonna leave my child. And other people said, I want, I want them out of here. They're just gonna suffer here. And still you have that here in, in, in where I live. You have families here that are supporting the families over there that send them money and then, you know, 
But you know, when you've had a stable life in one country, it's hard to imagine when people come to this country because there's a freedom opportunity, you know, Western Europe too, but you know, those decisions, you have to live it. I mean, I hear the stories of the persecution and the lack of freedom and, you know, I grew up with it. So unless you live it, it's, you know, and you have that experience, it's hard to, to understand it, just like anything else, you know? Amazing, you gave the perfect example. They couldn't have been a more perfect example, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you for the vulnerability and courage to speak to it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening. And I, I remember like when I left India, the same question was asked, how can you leave, right? How can you leave your uh, mother and leave your family and be away? But we have to make a choice. Yeah. And always know it's for the greater good. It's, it's always for expansion. Expansion of consciousness. Kelly and Kelly, did you want to say something? Thank you, Michelle. Um, well, first of all, I really in, enjoyed yeah. April's perspective because she pretty much nailed it on the head in terms of the, the judgment, the projection in this question. Um, people in, in the West, especially, well, generally regardless of where you go people have a, a complete misunderstanding of enlightenment and we're we're sold this um very whitewashed story about this dude named jesus and uh you you got to remember that you know jesus took a whip to the money lenders and he drew you know a line in the sand to protect people and he also walked away from conflict too so even though, you know, Jesus was this uh, master of awareness, the uh, historical points of reference that we actually have for his participation in society are ones where he both stood up and fought for the less fortunate and also walked away from conflict when it was appropriate. So you can't assume, you cannot project onto the concept of an enlightened being being able to make the right decision and stay and fight or leave or whatever you can't that's that's ego that is straight up ego and uh also um a bit of an emotional fixation in terms of wanting an, an enlightened being to fix the situation right to be a savior which well as we all know and one of the reasons why i i enjoy buddhist concepts so so well is that you know, Buddha's famous dying words is that basically your salvation is entirely up to you. No one's going to come and save you. You have to work for it. Um, the military action that's going on in Eastern Europe right now is really unfortunate. There's, you know, things. <laughs> I do my research and I don't listen to mainstream media very much uh, because I've had to learn how not to work in for First Nations for 30 years. But I won't go down that rabbit hole. Uh, that's uh, gets a little crazy, a little, little too quick. But in reality, you have to be aware of the emotional need to have a right and wrong. And one of the biggest issues is that a lot of people are being played off of this separation and this judgment into right and wrong. And being the, the history, not that I am, and the military history, not that I am, it is very, very easy for the powers that be to throw at the general public a lot of judgment and to use media to influence people's perception and people's judgment of the situation. It is really unfortunate that a lot of innocent individuals are being caught in the middle of you know, the powers that be flexing their military might and stuff like that. That is always an unfortunate um, in, yeah, I have too many words that I want to use right now. It, it is always awful. There we go. There, there's, a, there's a nice, simple word. All. It's just, just yeah. an awful situation going on in the Ukraine. Um, and, you know, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be alive and wanting to live 
and wanting to not be involved and not caught in conflicts such as this. So, and you know, there, there are like, you know, the Mennonites out of my family, the, the, my, my grandpa was a refugee for seven years in Europe when he left uh, the Southern U part of Ukraine to come to Canada and the you know Mennonites are supposed to be pacifists but there are men in the congregation that took up arms and as a kid I, I met some of these individuals who were always sort of like left alone in the church because they they were shunned because they they decided to take the violence upon themselves in order to protect everybody and they basically wanted to live in peace and there's nothing wrong with wanting to live in peace. I think that's something that everybody wants. And what we're witnessing is people who don't believe in peace flexing and wanting to control and wanting to impose their perception of reality on other people. I mean, normal people who just want to live in peace. And while, yeah, it's, you know, it's unfortunate if uh, our elders are sort of, you know, some of the elders in, in that region are, choosing to just stay and to accept their fate and to tell others to leave because, you know, they have, you know, they're still young and they still have their whole life ahead of them. I've, I've seen interviews with, you know, um, grandmothers who survived the Holocaust and who survived concentration camps and then settled in the Ukraine and figured that they would be there for the rest of their lives. And now they're displaced again and never thought this would ever happen again in their lifetime, except here they are. So there's a lot of learning that's going on. And I feel, if anything, this is almost like an acceleration of people waking up, almost an acceleration of bringing more darkness to the surface so that we can see it even clearer. So the current generation can really, really see and wake up to how dangerous it is to normalize violence and to normalize accepting um, governments dragging them into something that they want nothing of and how people really do want to live a peaceful life. The things that are being brought up to the surface, you know, there's a lot of issues in politics. We're still dealing with the aftermath of World War II I mean, you know, the, the geopolitics and the separation and the splitting of countries after, after World War II, like we're still dealing with that. And that's sort of what I see here. And there's a lot of reflection to be had. But um, yeah, heavy topic. I feel too that unless you're in that situation, how would you know what choice you would make? Yeah. So it's, I really appreciate what April said. I don't really have much more to say on it than that. And thank you, Michelle, for sharing mm -hmm. what you were what you were you were saying. Because I do feel that unless you're actually in that situation, how can you judge what 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 choice anybody should make? Because what I don't know what I would do. Yep. So. Yeah, my 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 mom would tell me stories when she was in Cuba that my brother and sister were like two or three. And she saw that you could, the food was not on the shelves. You couldn't get like baby food and the formula. And mm -hmm. she told my dad, we're going, we're going. Under the guise that Castro said, you know, it, the communism was never spoken at the beginning. It was just, you know, but once she saw the writing on the wall, she says, we're leaving. And so she had to, you know, my father had to leave his parents behind because he's got kids, you know? So everybody's got to make that choice for themselves and there is no judgment there, you know? And it's like, uh, thank you, Kelly and Kelly and Michelle. Um, it's the same thing that Abraham Hicks says, right? The contrast is given so that we can make the choice, send that rocket of desire. They rocket of desire being, I don't want to be in these, I don't want to raise my children. And it always is to do all of us want our children to do better than what we went through, right? So for the great, that's the desire. Let me provide more for my children. And it looks like your parents did, did that, right? And so, I think about the compact, like now I look back and, and 
when we would judge our own parents, right? Mm -hmm. For did they know better? I'm like, I look back now, I said, I can't imagine how my parents grew up as children living with their parents having like all of that. And there's such compassion now that I feel for my grandparents and my parents because I am living the fruits of that sacrifice. And all of a sudden, what they had to go through to get here. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of gratitude yes. for making those choices and those sacrifices. And there's some members of my family that are still judging parents for doing what parents do and living in suffering and they won't let it go. They won't let it go. So that's their choice. I was lis be listening to Eckhart's uh, module on School of Awakening, the teacher called Suffering. Oh. Suffering is the greatest spiritual teacher until a spiritual teacher comes along. And it may be okay that they suffer and suffer and suffer and pass away. It may take them another lifetime, right? But that is their path. That is that soul's journey. And... I'm just infinitely grateful that all of you are making the choice to live a conscious life. So the group here, the group online, everyone is making a choice. And that's like extremely humbling. So thank you. Thank you for that. Out of all that, Michelle, you are the generation, you and your husband are the generation that are breaking the patterns and are living the compassionate, empathetic, unconditional love that is our innate nature. So their sacrifices were perfect in what choices they made, right? And still pulling me along because my son is pulling me an extra mile, right? To offer him like the previous question, right? How, you know, wanting to fix it, right? Wanting to fix and there's no fixing there. It's just unconditional love and when i offer that unconditional love and that unconditional presence there's joy in him there's joy yes. when i when i pull back i see it the tension the closing in that he closes up it's just amazing so it just pulls you it continues to grow consciousness wants to continue to grow and expand I do believe that too. So isn't it somewhere where Eckhart says, uh, we think that uh, our children should not suffer, but suffering has its own transmutation, alchemy of turning base metal into gold. And that soul is going to make its journey and it's okay, however it is, right? Acceptance of the present moment, radical acceptance of the present moment. So thank you. Ken, did you want to say something about this? Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm just, to be honest, I'm blown away on how many things are coming together uh, and how many ways that we can see presence, power, in nature, in the weather, in the seasons, how many things are repeated throughout the world. Um, and it's amazing how different parts of the world, or if we can look at different parts of the country, we can look at different sectors and see, it's like a code. It's like how many things are, are, are mirrored. Like I can look at myself, my whole body and go, I'm just a mirror of the earth. Uh, more and more, I'm seeing the presence and everyone in the group and just listening. And I've never experienced this type of energy or this type of performance um, of, of how things are just coming together, like effortlessly. Um, I can even see my 12 step groups and go, oh my God, I'm seeing the mirror on the suffering, the addiction, how many times we relapse. People come in 
And then we're talking about the different countries, different laws and different things. And I'm going, this is all because of what's unconscious and conscious. And then you can see both sides where some people are fighting towards something where other people, they're actually in denial of fighting against it. So it's just so amazing to be a witness and experience how things are coming together in the presence energy. Um, and, and seeing how powerful that is. And, 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 then, and then really listening and seeing how some people are allowing you actually walking away from some of these things, realizing that that is the best thing you can do. And then it even, even today, it brought up my son on how I felt and how as things go around again and again, how much I'm learning with the fragmented wounded pieces that I didn't see or, or other, with other people. And then realizing as we grow, just like a plant or a tree, I feel like as we grow, we expand our knowledge, our understanding, and it just brings things together in a way that I wouldn't understand if I wasn't in the presence energy. So I'm just so, so, so grateful and so, so thankful for, for being a part of this. So thank you. Thank you so much, Ken. Thank you. Pat Patricia, you want to wrap this up? And uh, what I wanted to say before P Patricia speaks, uh, eternal gratitude to the people of Poland for accepting all the refugees from Ukraine. And goes to you as well, Patricia, since as you're from Poland. Thank you. Representative, but yes, I must say that the first thought in my head when I learned about all of this and how Polish people immediately rushed and united to help their neighbors and with all the uh, Americans sending help and international, you know, different charities, everybody's just sending donations. It's, it's really incredible how the rest of the world is getting together in, you know, helping those souls and, but doing it instead of, you know, fighting, it's really doing it just on the good side. And that's, in a sense, that was a gift for Poland because for, for years they were fighting internally against each other politically. It was so much, so much petty BS basically going on that it was just a shame to even listen to. And then all of a sudden that all disappear in an instant. Everybody's just helping bringing the families, the, fa the Ukraine's mothers and the children. They're opening motels, hotels, everything, you know, to provide them with, uh, yeah, they, they leave without clothes, without anything. So everything has to be provided and Polish families are taking them in, you know, to live with them and stuff. So it's incredible how this, tough situation also is an opportunity to open hearts you know for and mm. and that so that's uh, an Eckhart I think says that how do you know what do you need to um to grow to be in presence like what experience will give that to you and that's the experience you're experiencing basically that's what you know, consciousness is giving you so it, it's supposed to be as is exactly and it's your chance to it, see it as a gift of uh, its opportunity to awaken and train in this consciousness so yes mm -hmm. so as a as a representative of polish people yes i i, I want to thank you <laughs> to to everyone that's also you know sending money and donations to Poland because Poland is, you know, is incredibly helpful, you know, to their neighbors and 
it's all, I guess, was meant to be. And we suffered as a nation. There's so much uh, history behind it. Even at some part of um, history, Poland and Ukraine were like the one country, a lot of the lands because the borders were always moving there. And um, we had the same fight because Russia was after, uh, you know, after the Cold War, during the Cold War, Russia was just controlling uh, all of that region. I mean, Poland was still an independent country, but our government was controlled by Russia. So we know exactly what it means. So that's that's why it's like helping yourself basically. <laughs> and bottom line is, I think uh, Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia, he is just that super ego. He's just that example of just very, you know, old blown up ego that's still saying, well, there's still some work to be done. <laughs> You enlightened people of the rest of the world think that you're so good in, on that path, on the journey. But now look at this, it's not done yet. So it's an opportunity. And we just, we just came out of, they call it war, but it was really, yeah, dealing with COVID all around the world. So people united and understood each other because we were all dealing with the same thing. And now maybe it's even easier to be empathetic to now to anywhere in the world, people suffering because we realize that we are all one. So we cannot be comfortable sitting in our homes, watching TV and not doing anything when somewhere in the world, there is war going on. So I think that also, brought that attention that we are all one and we just help each other beautiful thank and you so uh, one of the results of uh, that conflict is actually that the people of poland the empathy and compassion in that region has increased and all the division he's my enemy ukraine is my enemy has dropped right and they're pulling all these people into their homes which you don't know what kind of a person you're bringing into your home but just have that heart right that goodness that okay my door is open i'll give you a meal i'll give you clothes and everything so one of the things that we can do is i've done it through my company i've donated so if anybody wants to do something for the people of Ukraine. The one thing we can do is give donations for sure. So I would highly encourage everyone. Uh, my company matches, so it kind of helped. So I doubled my donation, right? Uh, because they do a matching gift. Um, this was incredibly amazing. Thank you so much everyone for your insights and wisdom. It was a like perfect on the spot, on target as always. We will meet again next Wednesday. Infinite gratitude. Thank you so much for being vulnerable. Many blessings. Much love. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.